Welcome to Heath Cabot and Georgina Ramsey, who are the co-editors of the special issue of Humanity uh, on the theme of de-exceptionalizing displacement. Uh, Heath is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Pittsburgh, and Georgina is Associate Professor, is that right? Assistant, Assistant Professor. <laughs> Assistant Professor um, of Anthropology at the University of Delaware. So uh, warm welcome to you both. Thank you very much for making the time to talk about um, what I think is really a very exciting um, special issue. And I've had the privilege of reading all the papers and not having to, uh, not having the responsibility of editing the journal. Um, so it's just been a great experience for me. Um, so I wanted to ask you, first of all, what gave you the idea for the special issue? I guess I can, I can get started. Um, yeah, so I guess um, <clears throat> Georgie and I um, had the pleasure of meeting each other um, at a very interesting time. It was 2016 spring, is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was kind of, there was just so much um, fascination at the time sort of emerging around mobility and, and refugees in particular. And we both, um, for different reasons, I think were, um, there was just a real just general dissatisfaction we were both feeling about this field that we'd both somehow, you know, been, that all our work had been about up until that point, right? Sort of thinking about refugee related issues broadly construed. Um, and so sort of, we, I think we were, there was a sort of sense of um, the exploitative and extractive nature of that, which we'd encountered very explicitly both in field work and um, as well as, as in the scholarship more broadly. Um, and I think there was also, I mean, certainly for the conversations we've had, um, you know, our empirical material had started pointing beyond questions of movement. I mean, I've been thinking about sort of issues of um, uh, healthcare access and um, for, for Greek citizens, for instance, and long-term residents. And so what I was noticing was there was a lot of overlap in the kinds of issues that people who'd been displaced, recent arrivals, and people who were, had been, let's say, displaced in place and sort of were dealing with these long-term issues of poverty, access to livelihoods, et cetera. So, yeah, I think that was sort of, that would be my answer, Georgie. Yeah, I think um, a lot of the, uh, there was a tendency for a lot of work to be reactive and even, not even just work. I don't want to point the, the, the finger at scholars, but you know, you see it in terms of grants that were coming out around that time, 2016, the whole like monetizing of research. There was so much framing around refugees, refugees and, and migrants and uh, specifically in Europe and it was just so frustrating from the external perspective to think that, you know, we, we're going to be telling the same stories with that framing. Like, we might get that there's, there's specificities of experience that are going on, but at the core, what it means to be a migrant or a displaced person in many of these contexts is that it's not fun, right? It's not good. And, and so it's like, we see these sorts of like tendencies to reproduce narratives of suffering and they're not productive, they're, they're reductive actually. So, uh, and that wasn't being troubled, I think, uh, in, in scholarship. I think there was a lot of like over the, you know, dining room tables discussions between scholars about like how problematic this all is. And it's like, yeah, so why don't we write about that? So that's kind of what Heath and I decided to do. So, yeah. And, and the theme, the theme, de-exceptionalizing displacement, why, I mean, so I kind of get the area. <laughs> yeah. How did you hit upon that? Well, in addition to thinking maybe it had a little bit of a ring to it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I think, so I sort of building on what Georgie was talking about, sort of the search for solidarity and the sense of frustration that a lot of us were feeling, I think, with the way scholarship was headed. Um, sort of, I, th I think this named, a t um, this was a way of naming, of pushing back against this kind of state of exception. A lot, so much of, of refugee related issues had been framed in scholarship in particular 
as exceptional, you know, a gambit, drawing on a gambit and this kind of state of exception, whether it's the camp, whether it's the juridical position of people who've been displaced across borders. Um, a lot of it was really talked about in the sense of um, as, as something that is the so-called exception to the norm. And I think there was also at the time critically thinking about crisis, both in terms of um, refugee or migrant crisis, let's say in always in scare quotes, but also economic or other forms of, of, of um, crisis-like moments that seem to be experienced or understood as rupture. Um, and so um, I guess just to sort of push these things away from the exceptional um, and kind of think about what happens when these become um, normative or sort of everyday kind of understandings. And just, just to be clear, I mean, we're not the first people to have been, I mean, we're not even pretending to be the first people to be doing this. I mean, there's a lot of work that has already come out sort of thinking about the normative ways in which crisis functions. Um, but I think this was kind of a processual moment for us to kind of reframe how we were thinking about and approaching displacement. So one of the um, themes I think that comes out from the from the different contributions, having you know having read them quite carefully, I think is um, the ways in which they um, challenge kind of binary thinking. Whether you're talking about you know migrants and citizens or um, refugees and economic migrants. So I think that's quite interesting. How do you think that displacement has kind of managed to tease that um, open to us? Mm. So I, I don't find those kinds of binary thinking to be particularly like useful. Um, and, and nor do I, I, I don't think that they actually reflect what goes on in people's lives within those categories, you know? So it's like, migrants are often citizens of an elsewhere right and we often like denaturalize that when we talk about them as specifically migrant people um which is what nicole constable's paper in the si is like really getting to and, and i love that um and like citizens are also often mobile so you know so they're migrants in a sense like there's so many particularly in the, the north american context um there's so many like tales and stories of of very significant moments of movement within the frame of a citizen. So it, it just stops making sense to be talking about these, these categories as if they're, they're built in uh, exclusivity to, it, to each other. And you know, my sort of grounding is in the, the refugee slash economic migrant uh, category and that's a division that is like so porous and thin that it, it's basically non-existent. I mean, you can't talk about people fleeing war and persecution as if they're not also fleeing instability and poverty. I mean, like these are literally events that disrupt their capacity to survive and exist. So what is mobility in that sense, except for like a, a, a mechanism to create survival and, and stability? So I, I was always just feeling so frustrated by this like denaturalization between the people's categorization in the present and like all of the structures that went in place to produce those. And, and it, there's a lot of fantastic work going on right now about the fact that that's reproducing a very like neo-colonial goal. You know, it's creating distinctions between people as if we don't live in the same world. Mm -hmm. as if we're not actually sharing struggles so you know Heath was talking before about the you know this being sort of a, a step or a thread towards like more solidarity within scholarship and it's like we we need to like model that solidarity in our analytical framing so like recently I've been calling these binaries like analytical borders because I think it's like really interesting that we have appropriated the logics of bordering that we so often claim to critique into like specifically uh, our, our work. And, you know, and I'm not saying that there isn't a qualitative difference between like a migrant and a citizen. There is, you know, I, I'm the first person to acknowledge that. I've worked with people like that. I am a migrant as well, you know, so I, I know what it's like to, to not have the same rights as other people. There's a very like political, legal, juridical, like qualitative experience there, but, I just, I, I think that we need to be sort of like looking at ways of expanding that and not reinforcing those as the parameters of our analysis. Like we can do more. So 
you know, my critique recently with these binaries has been that they're kind of shifting like we're, we keep reproducing the problematic object as the migrant without like <laughs> looking at the structures that produce the migrant. So it sounds really obvious. And I mean, your work is like the, the key person who did this, like I think, like one of the, you're, you're at the cold front of this. So yeah, I think that displacement potentially is one way to like collapse that a little bit and it, like at least complicate it. So that's, that's what so many of the papers are doing, I think, uh, which makes it so exciting. <laughs> Just to kind of like, turn it on its head a bit then. So, you know, so, so in the in the introduction, you argued that displacement um, is a political tool to legitimize or delegitimize certain claims to rights and protection, which is kind of effectively what you've just said. Um, so is this so is this then is is then using displacement also not replicating this same process is it actually a useful label oh i think that's a really great question and i mean it gets to the limits of theorization i mean at what point does everyone become displaced and like you know i don't think i don't want to speak on behalf of heath but i don't think we're trying to produce like some latour version of like a meta theory of what it means to live in this existential moment but but i think that there's just some really glaring contradictions in the politicization of displacement that I think get too, they're, they're not problematized enough in work. So like I've been following, one of my like weird little ticks is to follow the UNHCR figures at a glance uh, webpage. And I check in on it about once a month. And I've been doing that for three years because <laughs> I just like, <laughs> wanting to look at the numbers. And I mean, spoiler alert, they, they don't have any new numbers since the end of 2019. So uh, I've been checking throughout 2020. But so the, the number at the end of 2019 was 79.5 million people displaced. So think about that. My country, Australia has 20, 25 million people. So eight is, let's just say 80 million. That's the same population as Germany approximately. So it's, it's we're talking, massive numbers but the the thing that really got me was about like midway through 2020 the UNHCR shifted its language from displaced to forcibly displaced and I was like hmm so what is the distinction there <laughs> like does anyone kind of just decide like I'm going to be displaced today so it's <laughs> like you know and this is just a simple like little linguistic thing but it's it, it's part of this process of like embedding notions of deservingness into this and I don't think we're I don't think politically policy wise we're equipped to deal with this number this scale not number this scale of displacement that we're dealing with in the sense of like that that UNHCR number only looks at refugees asylum seekers and internally displaced people who are 45 million so my question is like, what about the millions of people that are going to be displaced because of climate change and disaster? Like, at what point does, do we start to like, look at these things in the same lens? But in just to like, sort of- Or city blocks. I mean, there's also exactly. that, right? I mean- Exactly. <laughs> no, exactly. So I, it made me think of Haiti, actually, which is weird. It's not any, no paper in the SI about this, but I was thinking about Mark Shula's work, which was on the, like, the earthquake that hit Haiti in, in 2010. And, you know, it was a disaster. It was a displacement disaster. There's still people living without access to stable housing because of an earthquake in 2010. And his book, Humanitarian Aftershocks, argues that it was neoliberalism that created the problem. It wasn't the earthquake. And I remember reading that book and thinking about homelessness in the US. And I was like, that's the disaster. Like the slow moving, grinding, normalization of neoliberal principles about you know <clears throat> deservingness that are like producing these sorts of problems so yeah i think that like we need to pay attention to how these juridical categories are sort of used and weaponized <clears throat> in in different contexts so i i'm not sure if that answers your question but like it's a provocation you know yeah. I, I don't have the answer <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, so to just sort of um, continue the provocation, um, uh, how did, so, so when you were putting the special issue together, 
uh, on displacement, then um, we suddenly uh, are in the situation of COVID, um, which obviously has sort of dramatic implications for um, the ways in which people do and don't move and get stuck. And so um, uh, I wonder if you can tell me something about how you kind of responded to that as editors of the special issue. Did you decide this is, yeah, do, did you feel like you had to accommodate it somehow in your introduction? Um, yeah, what did you, what did you do? <laughs> well, no, it's, it's funny because there was on the one hand, this sort of, <clears throat> We're all working on our papers when this all hit, right? We've submitted the first draft of the special issue right before um, I think lockdown started in the spring. And so um, on the one hand, there's this kind of tendency to want to write whatever the moment is, as if it's like the end, end of history <laughs> into whatever we're doing at the moment. At the same time, this was a pretty big thing, right? <laughs> Not, in, I mean, um, so, so, but I think, I think uh, the way a lot of others have talked about COVID, um, you know, as being sort of this prism that, or you no, know, so as being something that's very refractive, that sort of has made existing inequities, existing problems, it ha has thrown them to the surface, and I think that's how we're how we write it in, um, in the sense that it's uh, on the one hand we've had this experience of being stuck um, uh, that a lot of us <laughs> have experienced in a very different way um, than, than, we, than, you know, it's not this sort of peaceful stay at home, but this kind of enforced way in which mobility becomes really difficult, even mobility to the corner store, right? Um, so on the one hand, that did sort of force a bit of a reckoning for um, sort of how we spend our days and our time and how we think about our socialities and our networks. Um, I think there's also this idea of the sort of generative nature of these sort of shift and in, 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 in daily life, right? The way that social lives can become weirdly thickened, um, even through these forms of isolation. So it's definitely been very generative when we think about, um, yeah, the relationship between place movement, access to livelihoods and well-being and, um, and belonging in, in a larger sense, right? Um, and, um, but on the other hand, I think that it's, it's clearly, uh, there's this question of how, you know, inequities, race, uh, race in particular in the US and poverty and our useless healthcare system, um, all of these things have really come to the fore, which I think highlight another theme in the special issue that um, goes beyond the specificities of this particular moment, which is, um, that, that, that displacements to really take account of, of that um, are layered, right? On that we have to think about them within a context of sort of accreted forms of experience and structural inequality that sometimes, um, you know, become visible in a particular way or take on new <laughs> manifestations or have new kinds of effects that are of course important, but sort of we, we can't understand this event without locating it within the wider within the wider context. And that, that's in some ways just being, you know, a good scholar or doing good, good social analysis, but there's so much focus on whatever the present is that there's a tendency to kind of erase where it came from. And that's something we definitely wanna push against in the special issue. So what do you think uh, in the special issue you can get from reading all of these papers together that you don't get from just reading them separately? What are the, so I suppose this is a question really in partly about themes, you know, the themes that seem to be emerging naturally from the papers as a collection. Do you want to start? Or do you want me to? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm just thinking, because I was thinking about the, the core of what I think the papers are really showing is that displacement is about how we relate to to place and where we are and your COVID question just made me think about that a lot because I, I feel at least at a personal scale that there, there's been this thing with displacement in the past year where it's like you sort of look around your way of life and you just it doesn't feel right it has like this affective sort of like there's a, there's something that's shifting that relationship and I think a lot of people in like uh, like are looking at the future and, and place and thinking like this is not a stable home for anyone anymore you know so I think that the COVID reckoning is also linked to, to that and Keith's work in the, the SI talking about the uncanny I think 
is like a key part of this because it's I, the COVID situation and this feeling of uncanniness was like a really crucial like moment for me. But anyway, I, I think that a lot of our papers are getting to that. It's that core relationship between what it means to feel in 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 relationship to to space and place and and all of the ways that that gets sort of refracted through other uh, other ways of being as well. So it's one of the, I think, I'll, I'll just talk about one major theme that came out, which I found really interesting because it was organic. I don't know, like Heath sort of saw this unfold too, because <laughs> Heath was reading all these papers. And uh, so I have a paper separately in the SI as well. And I started going on this like really weird tangent about talking about what it means to be human and the fact that rooted in displacement is this like core rejection of your own humanity within the context that you're living. And I was like, oh boy, like this is a tangent. I'm not sure how this is gonna work, but it's coming out organically. And then he sort of looked at my paper and it's like, well, a lot of the other papers are doing that too. So like uh, Mich particularly like Michelle's paper and, and Heike's paper, like there's this real like return back to humanity as a core part of displacement. Like it's not like we've had a lot of discussion about is it precarity or is it displacement? And I think what really like disassociates the, those two things in our SI is that the people in these spaces are not just living with instability. They're living with this dehumanization in their own lives. So that is like a key theme that I think has really emerged and, and is a really provocative point for opening up other broader discussions from different scholars about displacement and what it means to be displaced. And I, and yeah. I think, oh, oh, sorry. So I was just gonna say, I really, I think that's really true. And I, um, that, that kind of point about precarity, I think is really interesting. You know, it gives us a lot to think, of, think about. And then there was also that, yeah, that <laughs> that phrase in your introduction about the uncanny, or a couple of sentences, there wasn't very much. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. <laughs> yeah, that was all Heath. It's like, it's <laughs> this is incredible really, This is really interesting. I'm gonna have to kind of really, I really want to think more more about this. Anyway, sorry, he. No, no, it's it's actually okay. Um, because I, I, I that's one thing that I, um, sorry, I wanted to like say to I, I feel like I need to just explain briefly about the uncanny because I was actually talking to somebody in my in my current research on on health and on I mean it's not on migration at all and this guy like was talking about how when he comes back to Athens he feels uncanny. <laughs> And it was really, it was this interesting moment where I was like, wow, like, thank you for directing me back there. And so the more I started reading sort of, I think in anthropology in particular, but also qualitative scholarship, the, the focus on experience, affect, emotion, feeling, um, you know, the more I sort of dug into that, the more it seemed to be rooted in this kind of um, attention to the sensorium, you know, like, like the, the feeling that something's wrong, but I can't really explain what's wrong about it. Um, which I really think a lot of the sort of work um, that's grounded on Floyd, <laughs> right? This, this, this idea of psychic wellness or, or being at home or not at home. Um, anyway, so that's what, just an aside. I just wanted to add one thing um, or two things actually, if, if I can, about the um, reading across the papers. Um, you know, the, the people we invited into this conversation were in many ways already doing some of the kind of work that we were really interested in, in learning from. So um, whether, you know, for long, uh, throughout their scholarship and coming from different sites and different conversations, but I, what, what was so interesting was to see how, how it's not that people are all doing the same thing, but they're, they're I think they're, they're in, in trying to think beyond a singular kind of category or classification and think um, in a sort of, interrelated relational way, actually Michelle Monique uses this term of relationality um, or um, systems. We're, we're sort of drawing a lot lately on Catherine Bestiman's new book on racialized global apartheid. Sort of to, because when you start thinking in a system scale or, or, or no, not thinking, but just sort of contextualizing the present or the specific in a systems context, it, it, because it doesn't become exceptional at all, we, we start tracing the connections and how they express or work out in specific in specific instances. So I thought that was something else that was really important. And the other final thing about humanity, you know, there's this real danger of like, to what extent can you sort of take seriously, let's say, processes of, of 
of, through which people are sort of um, precluded from flourishing. Okay. While on the other hand, not re reaffirming some ahistorical idea of capital H humanity. And this has been sort of a little bit of a tension throughout the papers. And I think one thing we've arrived at is that ideas of what's human and the boundaries between human and less than are historical and culturally specific. They're situated. At the very same time, the capacity to flourish may be something that, that maybe transcends these different moments. And sort of there is a sort of way in which the human itself is politicized, weaponized to um, exclude others. And so that's been also something that we've been looking at as well. And I think, I think um, uh, Susan Coutine's paper deals with that a lot, the different ways in which humanity is sort of weaponized in and of itself. So anyway. These are just some sort of, I, I would say that it's been very generative to look across the papers. And it's definitely showed me that we're not trying to come up with, again, a meta theory or meta concept. Hopefully we're not gonna be writing a paper in five years <laughs> defending displacement as a concept. This is a step, this is a way to open up other kinds of questions. Great, <laughs> fantastic note to end on. Thanks very much, Heath and Georgina. And thanks for all your work pulling together this fantastic special issue. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Bridget. <laughs>